Thank you for downloading episode 40 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. As a treat, I thought I'd bring you something a little bit different. A true story which doesn't contain a murder, a manslaughter, a motive, a culprit, a killer or a crime. And although a dead body was found, strangely there was no autopsy, trial or investigation. On the surface, this may seem like a simple story of an unnamed man who died lost, unloved and forgotten. And yet his life and death led to one of the most remarkable stories ever told. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about Glyndor Michael, a nobody, a nothing, a homeless man who became a hero. And although he saved my life, your life, and all of our lives, almost 80 years on, his name is hardly known. Murder Mile contains shocks, surprises, and moments of satire, as well as loud and realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 40 The Fascinating Life, Death, and Afterlife of Glyndor Michael. Today, I'm standing, um, somewhere. Straight ahead, is the rear of King's Cross Station. Behind is the canal. To the left is the tunnel where the body of Sebastiano Magnanini was tied to a shopping trolley and dumped. Where nearby, two kids found the bits of Paula Fields. And ahead are three key locations in the life of the Camden Ripper, coming soon to Murder Mile. But exactly where I am is uncertain. The appropriately named Goods Way was once one of London's industrial hubs. As being perfectly positioned at the back of King's Cross Station and flanked by a wealth of warehouses, wharfs, grain stores and even an ice cellar, although Goods Way was once a big part of Britain's economic lifeblood, today its industry is gone. Where was once Goods Way and Granary Square with dark dens of iniquity, where, having quaffed a pie and a pint, a workman would plunge his pathetic pecker into a prosy's clunge for ten bob bits and a yank on her tits. Now, it's so much nicer. With its posh stone steps, outdoor artwork, and wee-inducing water features, the granary square of today is riddled with office arseholes, lazy lunchtime loafers and desk-bound dickheads in deck chairs, all sunning it up in the choking smog, as they scoff painfully pretentious sarnies, packed full of offal, seeds, weeds and old cheese. As it's here that without any hint of irony, the office place wankers congregate to whore out their mouths to foodie fashion. Today, the whole square swarms with open-mouthed idiots, all sucking on an artisan sausage, chowing down on a clotted cream pie, or squirting their gentleman's relish across an overstuffed kebab. All whilst the big knobs and the fannies watch the Wimbledon tennis on a stupidly sized screen and fight the urge to come on Tim. And although it's a ridiculous place, it was here, on Tuesday the 26th of January 1943, somewhere 
at the back of King's Cross Station, in an unknown, derelict warehouse, that a hungry, broke, and homeless man called Glyndor Michael changed the world forever. Born on the 4th of January 1909, in the dilapidated ground floor flat of 136 Commercial Street, a two-storey brown brick terraced house in the tiny mining town of Abubagoed in the borough of Kafili, South Wales. As an illegitimate, illiterate and disabled child, born to an unmarried mother and a chronically ill alcoholic father, Glindor's misfortune began before he was even born. As a recent divorcee with two young daughters to feed, his illiterate and impoverished mother, Sarah Ann Chadwick, was forced to marry the first available unmarried man, simply to survive, and moved in with a 35-year-old colliery haulier called Thomas John Michael. As a Welsh Baptist, a lifelong coal miner, and a devoted father, Sarah had done okay. And although he provided a modest income to his soon-to-be family of five children, life would only get worse, as Thomas was not a well man. Being riddled with syphilis, a sexual infection whose symptoms often begin with red rashes, seeping sores, and festering lesions on the mouth, genitals, or anus, an end by spawning into the debilitating, disfiguring, and deadly infection of the spine and brain called neurosyphilis. Thomas passed this on, not only to Sarah, but also to their unborn son. From birth, it was obvious that Glyndor was different. As being crippled by a lack of coordination, confusion and concentration, with a severe weakness in his muscles, sight and movement, being constantly struck down by headaches, tremors and seizures, and debilitated by frequent bouts of depression, psychosis and early onset dementia, although he wasn't classified as an invalid, for the rest of his life, he would suffer from the deformities in his bones, his eyes, and his brain. And so began the early life of Britain's most unlikely hero, Glyndor Michael. Age 10, as the eldest boy of five siblings, Glyndor was forced to become a breadwinner as his ailing father struggled to feed their ever-expanding family. But being disabled, barely literate, and unfit to follow him into the pit, Glyndor took on any odd job, but it was never enough. And as a starving family carted their few possessions from flea-infested flat to dingy derelict hovel, being starved, ragged, and unable to pay the rent, as the work dried up, Thomas started to soak up his sadness with alcohol. By 1924, with their father, 51-year-old Thomas, being too sick to work, after three decades of his tired body being battered by alcoholism, syphilis and pneumoconiosis, a coal miner's disease which caused his lungs to rot blood to be coughed up, and the left of his chest to collapse. Being hungry and homeless, the seven members of the family were forced to squeeze into a single room at a charity hostel in Pontypridd. And as Thomas's depression slowly spiralled to darker depths, just shy of Christmas 1924, 15-year-old Glyndor watched as his thin, sickly and suicidal dad stabbed himself in the throat with a carving knife. And although he was barely a boy himself, 
with a broken body and a very fragile brain, Glyndor had to commit his own father to the Glamorgan County Lunatic Asylum in Bridge End, where having contracted both influenza and bronchial pneumonia, on the 31st of March 1925, his father, Thomas John Michael, died. Having witnessed his father's physical decline, mental collapse, suicide and death, all within his most formative years. As an impoverished boy, the only evidence that Glyndor Michael even existed is the shaky signature scrawled in the burial register at Trelaw Cemetery, as his father was interred in a pauper's grave. But for Britain's unsung hero, whose actions are estimated to have saved millions of lives, his own life was about to get even worse. With his parents having never married, not only was Glyndor cursed by the stigma of illegitimacy and crippled by disability, but with his mother unable to receive any benefits befitting a widow, with no savings or property, only debts, Glyndor and his mother were forced to survive on charity. And that's how it remained for the next 15 years. As being too poor to eat, too hungry to earn, and too sick to work, trapped in a damp, dark, and cramped back room, in a leaky cold coal miner's house at 135 Trelaw Road in the mining town of Tonopandi, lived a widowed mother and her disabled son. But then, on the 15th of January 1940, having suffered a heart attack, Glyndor's mother died. She was his rock, his world, his everything. He had nothing. He was a 31-year-old mentally disabled man with no parents to love him, no money to support him, no food to feed him, and no home to protect him. And with all four of his siblings having married or moved out, shortly after the burial of his beloved mother in a pauper's grave in Trelaw Cemetery, Glyndor disappeared. Between the 16th of January 1940 and the 26th of January 1943, for three whole years, Glyndor simply disappeared. For whatever reason, by the bitter winter of 1942, Glyndor was living in London, dossing in doorways, begging for change and rummaging through bins. And as one of thousands of anonymous homeless drifters who struggled to stay alive in this badly burned, bombed out city, by January 1943, Glyndor Michael had finally reached rock bottom and was lost, unloved and forgotten. And then came the day that would change world history forever. The evening of Tuesday the 26th of January 1943 was exceptionally cold. As a bitter biting wind blew a thick blanket of icy snow across the city and instantly hardened in the intense freezing frost. Being bitterly cold, wet, hungry and homeless. As the temperature dropped as low as minus 10, Glyndor stumbled into an abandoned warehouse at the back of King's Cross. After three years of isolation, malnutrition and infection, with his physical and mental health rapidly declining and being crippled by a lifelong hereditary infection, which riddled his weak and weary body 
with tremors, seizures, migraines, depression, arthritis, blindness, psychosis, paranoia, and dementia. Being cold, hungry, and confused. Off the dusty floor, Glindor ate a few scraps of stale bread. But this wasn't a kindly gift left by a generous benefactor or a piece of misplaced sandwich dropped by an already full night watchman, but a trap for rats. And as Glindor sat, shivering in the shadows, swallowing the stale lumps of bread, he didn't notice that the gooey residue slathered on top wasn't butter, jam, or even dripping, but a paste laced with highly toxic white phosphorus. Having mistakenly ingested mouthfuls of rat poison, as the deadly phosphide paste mixed with the hydrochloric acid in his gut and turned into clouds of highly toxic phosphine, the chemistry of his own body had begun to kill him. And as he lay on the cold and dusty floor of an unknown, disused warehouse somewhere in King's Cross. Being racked with cramp, fever and convulsions, as hot steamy vomit and smoking feces spewed from his orifices as his bowel started to boil. With no one knowing that he was even there, not only was Glyndor Michael lost, unloved and forgotten, but now he was dying. After two days of writhing in excruciating agony, with his central nervous system poisoned, as slowly it began to shut down his liver, his kidneys, his lungs and his heart. Having been found, Glyndor was rushed to the south wing of St Pancras Hospital. But having drifted into a coma, on Thursday the 28th of January 1943, 33-year-old Glyndor Michael was pronounced dead. And with his heart silent, his brain empty, and his blood cold, as rigor mortis set in, and every ounce of life left his slowly decomposing body, his career as a war hero had only just begun. In the bowels of St Pancras Hospital, hidden in the corner of its cold stone mortuary, Glyndor Michael was one of several corpses brought in that day, in varying states of injury and decay. And although he was an unremarkable man, to the coroner, Sir Bentley Purchase, he was perfect. Unlike the other deaths, Sir Bentley didn't give the dead tramp an autopsy. Unlike the other deaths, Sir Bentley didn't inform the dead tramp's family of his demise. And unlike the other deaths, although entirely illegal, Sir Bentley falsified the death certificate, lied to the registrar, denied the dead tramp a burial, concealed the body, and for the second time in the life of Glyndor Michael, he disappeared. That evening, Sir Bentley Purchase made contact with two British intelligence officers, Ewan Montague of the Royal Navy and Charles Chumley of MI5. And although Glyndor Michael was mentally disabled, physically unwell, and had no military training, having failed to enlist in the army on medical grounds, and even though he was already dead, he was about to embark on a secret mission into enemy territory in a truly audacious and daring scheme which would turn the tide of the Second World War. And its name was Operation Mincemeat.
Operation Mincemeat began life on the 29th of September 1939 as a directive from the Director of British Naval Intelligence, Rear Admiral John Godfrey, to engineer a series of cunning ploys to deceive the Nazis and lure their ships either directly into Allied minefields or away from key strategic actions. Of the 30 ideas concocted, number 28, against which the author had written, a suggestion, not a very nice one, was to give the Nazis access to deliberately misleading information, having concealed it on a dead body, dressed as a British officer and dumped into enemy waters. By 1943, after the failure of Dunkirk, which saw the mass evacuation of Allied troops from the French coast, the Allies needed to re-enter Europe and regain the upper hand. But with the bulk of Europe's coastline being heavily defended by the Germans, the only logical point of invasion for the Allies was Sicily. But everyone knew that. Even Sir Winston Churchill remarked that anyone but a bloody fool would know it was Sicily. Nazi intelligence needed to be deceived and German troops rerouted. So Britain had to convince Hitler that an Allied invasion was imminent. But not via Sicily, but 500 miles away in Greece and Sardinia. A deception was planned. Operation Mincemeat was born. And an unloved, lost and long forgotten dead tramp would become the hero that our country needed. Glyndor Michael was perfect. He had no physical injuries, no medical scars and no obvious cause of death. And with the phosphine gas having dispersed, the strychnine in his hair being hardly traceable, and with his lungs full of fluid owing to pneumonia, given a cursory autopsy, the Nazis would assume that he had drowned. So back in the St Pancras mortuary, with his body kept at a steady 4 degrees Celsius, the life of Glyndor Michael was erased as he became Major William Martin. In order to fool the Nazis, not only did Major William Martin need to have a name, a face and a body, but also he needed a life. And for this daring deception to work, it needed to be one as real as any other person. So Ewan Montague and Charles Chumley set about giving a dead man life. Born in Cardiff in 1907, 35-year-old acting major William Martin, known to his friends as Bill, was a recently promoted captain in the Royal Marines, a rank senior enough to handle sensitive papers. He was 5 foot 9 inches tall, with short dark hair, a neatly trimmed moustache and a slender physique more befitting a man used to desk work than a war zone. To legitimise his rank, Major William Martin was issued with a Royal Marines battle dress. Cut by Jeeves and Hawks, the military tailors at No. 1 Savile Row. Complete with all of the appropriate badges, flashes, insignia, braces, gaiters, size 12 boots a trench coat and a beret, each piece of which was personally worn every day by Charles Chumley to ensure that its wear and tear looked real. With the devil being in the detail, Major Martin was decorated with what MI5 described as pocket litter. Several pieces of small and seemingly unimportant fragments of everyday detritus which every person forgets that they carry, but which completes the detail of a person's ordinary life. 
So upon Major Martin would be found a book of stamps, a pack of cigarettes, a box of matches, a set of keys, a silver cross, a St. Christopher's medal, a pencil, a receipt from Jeeves and Hawks for a new shirt, ticket stubs for a West End show, a bill for four nights at the Naval and Military Club, a letter from his imaginary father, a note from his solicitor, an invoice from Lloyd's Bank demanding payment for his overdraft of £79.19 shillings and twopence. And even though Glyndor was single, inside his wallet was a photograph and two love letters from his fictitious fiancée called Pam. The life of Major William Martin was complete. And finally, they needed to construct the most important piece, the letter. To aid its authenticity, Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Nye personally composed a letter to General Sir Harold Alexander, commander of the Anglo-American 18th Army in Algeria and Tunisia. And although this two-page letter looked like a routine piece of correspondence between two high-ranking officers, hidden away in a single paragraph, amongst a mess of everyday military waffle, were two very matter-of-fact sentences, which stated that, with the Germans strengthening their defences in Greece and Crete, that the 5th Allied Division should be reinforced by one brigade for the assault on the beach south of Cape Aroxas, and also for the 56th Division in Kalamata. And that was it. Barely 30 words, scrawled in a letter and hidden inside a briefcase, which would be chained to the arm of a dead and entirely fictional naval officer who had supposedly died in an air crash and whose body would be found by the enemy floating in the sea off the coast of Spain. And given the diplomatic protocol denotes that any intercepted official correspondence must be returned, unopened, to its country of origin. To confirm if the document had fallen into enemy hands, inside, they had placed a single eyelash. When returned, if it was missing, they'd know that the Nazis had read the letter. The plan was audacious, risky, and ludicrous. But being so unbelievable was part of its brilliance. Having been shaved, dressed, and decorated with pocket litter, the body of Glyndor Michael, under the alias of Major William Martin, was packed into a vague metal container loaded with nine and a half kilos of dry ice and filled with carbon dioxide to refrigerate and preserve the body. On the 18th of April 1943, having been loaded by Charles Chumley and Ewan Montague into the back of a nondescript black 1937 Fordson van with a V8 engine, through the night, the metal container was driven at speed by racing champion St. John Horsfall, from King's Cross to Greenock on the west coast of Scotland, where it was loaded on board of an S-class British submarine called HMS Seraph. Eleven days later, at 4.15am, on Saturday the 30th of April 1943, just off the port of Huelva, on the southwest coast of Spain, as the dawn light glistened across a serenely calm sea, HMS Seraph surfaced. With the coast clear, the captain, Lieutenant Norman Jewell, and only his most senior of officers, placed the body of Major William Martin 
gently into the warm waters. And as the submarine's propellers slowly pushed the dead body towards the shore, Lieutenant Jewell read a passage from the 39th Psalm as Glyndor Michael floated into infamy. At a little after 9.30am, four hours later, just off the beach of La Mata Negra, a local fisherman called Antonio Rey Maria spotted the body, dragged it ashore, and notified the Spanish authorities, all under the watchful eye of Adolf Klaus, an unimaginative and easily duped German spy living in Huelva. Four days later, the briefcase was passed to Spanish naval headquarters in Cadiz. The letter was dried, photographed, resealed, soaked in salt water, reinserted into the envelope, and the information was passed to the Germans. On the 11th of May, the briefcase was returned to British authorities, minus a single eyelash. On the 14th of May, codebreakers at Bletchley Park intercepted a German message warning of an imminent invasion via Greece and Sardinia. At which, Brigadier Leslie Hollis sent a secret communique to Winston Churchill. It simply read, Mincemeat swallowed, rod, line and sinker. On the 9th of July, with Hitler having redeployed thousands of troops from the Russian Eastern Front in Kursk to Greece, Corsica and Sardinia, having launched one of the largest amphibious assaults of the war, 400,000 American and British troops invaded the woefully defended island of Sicily. It fell just eight days later. Two years later, the war was over. Glyndor Michael was a nobody, a nothing, a mentally and physically disabled man who died unloved, lost and forgotten in a derelict warehouse somewhere in King's Cross. And although he saved my life, your life and all of our lives, almost 80 years on, with no statues in his image, no streets in his honour, and no portraits in his likeness. His name is barely known. And yet, without Glyndor Michael, our lives would have been very different. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget to stay tuned to Extra Mile after the break. But before that, here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Witching Hour and Murder in My Family. Hey guys, I'm Amanda. And I'm Christina. So we know you're fans of the bazaar. If you can't get enough. And we know you can't. Then check out our podcast, The Witching Hour, Stories of the Macabre and Unusual. Join me and me and our co-host Jacob as we play a drinking game and laugh our way through tales of the paranormal, UFOs, serial killers, and the unexplained. Grab a cocktail or two and drink along to your favorite stories of the bazaar. Look for The Witching Hour, Stories of the Macabre and Unusual, wherever you get your podcasts. A big shout out goes out this week to my new Patreon supporters, who are Claire Bernardin, Dana Tarasenko, Leslie Quinones, Sue Harrison, and Nicole Graves, who all made my little chubby cheeks go all flushed with their supreme generosity. So to you guys, here's a kiss. Mwah! Don't worry, I don't have the lurgy. And also a quick hi to Doug and Karen, who booked onto my Murder Mile walk for their 20th anniversary. Because what's more romantic than that? 
And of course to Lynn and her family who came all the way from Vancouver to delve into some grisly Soho murders. So hello to you all. And if you like true crime blogs, there's a new fabulous one written by Andy, who's a massive true crime fan. It's called No Remorse. Check it out by clicking the link in the show notes. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Did that give you a fright? Did it? Was it good? Was it enjoyable? <laughs> I hope you're not driving. I hope you're sitting up, not sitting on the tube. I hope you just didn't just poop yourself. Uh, I thought it'd be an interesting start rather than a slower start. <laughs> uh, to new listeners, obviously, this is what I say every week. New listeners, this is Extra Mile. This is the little extra piece at the end of each episode. Uh, it's unscripted. Uh, it, there's no music. There's no sound effects except... You can probably hear in the background, uh, my kettle is on. I'm just making a cup of tea, because I fancy a cup of tea. Uh, so that's the only sound you'll hear. You might hear some coots outside. There's one outside is being a bit of a pain, and a train, and some planes flying over. But apart from that, this is Extra Mile, where we dive into the story we've just been listening to. Um, so that was a story that I've known about for, God, ages. Probably since I was a kid, but I've always wanted to tell that story. Um... And it was just no. Oh, hang on, tea's about to brew. Got a bit of cup of tea. There we go. Copper, sugar, milk, all the essentials. We even got some nice cake. Cake by the microphone and a nice bit of parking. Oh yeah. You don't know what parking is, it's like Jamaica it's basically Jamaica cake, but it's a little bit more earthy. Look, I think it's got I think it's got orange rind in it, so it makes it quite earthy. Coming back, I'm coming back. Cup of tea is down. Cake ready. Tea ready. I'm back. So that was the story of Glendor Michael. Uh, I love that story. You, you know me, I have a bit of a soft spot for kind of stories about about the underdog about kind of people who don't really achieve much but then they achieve either greatness or infamy I kind of like that and even if it's infamy in a bad way but but with uh Glyndor Michael you know he had it's such a rough start to his life really difficult born dis born disabled suffering with neurosyphilis based on a illness given to him by his dad couldn't work he's living in a difficult era anyway like turn of the turn of the nine uh turn of the 20th century so the early 1900s right until the day he died uh, only lived a short life 30 33 years 34 years um suffered with a lot of different illnesses which obviously got worse throughout his life abandoned by obviously his dad died his mum died his brothers and sisters basically abandoned him because they had their own struggles uh, and they you know, hard for them to look after a, a physically and mentally ill man. So then basically he became a homeless man, uh, drifting in London and he disappeared for about three years. Um, obviously we don't really know where he ended up. Um, different bits of details. But obviously this part of Extra Mile is where we dive into some extra things. So um, there's things I couldn't get into the story, so I'll dive into them now. I'll just have a swig of uh, tea. Um, so, there is debate about whether Glyndor Michael is, uh, the man himself. Now, all of the evidence seems to suggest that it is Glyndor Michael. The government has said it's Glyndor Michael. Obviously, we, they could test his DNA if they wanted to, because his body is still there, but whether they want to, we don't know. Um, there have, have been some scholars who said, uh, most people say it is Glyndor Michael. All the evidence seems to suggest that. There were some scholars who said it was either two Royal Navy sailors who were either Tom Martin or John Melville. 
um, Melvi, who were killed aboard H HMS Dasher, which sank on the 27th of March 1943. Uh, I would disagree with that because obviously we have uh, evidence of Glyndor Michael prior to that date. The dates just don't, those dates don't add up. Uh, they also said that the HMS Dasher was uh, a fuel explosion which resulted in a loss of 379 crew. Uh, the body, which was William Martin, a.k.a. Glyndor Michael, had no injuries at all. That was very important for the body because it was actually... Uh, so Bentley purchased the coroner and I didn't put him in the story, but Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the father of forensic science and home office pathologist around that time who dealt with the Black Eyed Ripper case, so like a year before he was dealing on the Black Eyed Ripper case... They were the ones who sat down and said, right, it's very important that if we have a man, he can't have injuries. So hence, remember at the start, I said that uh, Glendor Michael was in the mortuary and surrounded by people who died as a result of murder or car crashes or cancer or uh, you know, injuries, other illnesses. Yeah, he couldn't have any injuries on him. It's the same reason that Sir Bentley Purchase said he can't have an autopsy as well. He can't be seen to have an autopsy scar. He needs to be like a fresh body because... If you're a doctor and you pull a body out of the water, you go, oh, this is a dead body. Hang on, he's got an autopsy scar. What's going on? So he couldn't have any of that. So I entirely disagree that it can't be Tom Martin or John Melville because they obviously would have had fuel burns or things like that or lost at sea for a couple of days. They would be quite badly decomposed. Uh, but obviously the identity is, is very debated. There's uh, some Royal Navy scholars who, who deny that a... A vagrant would be able to pass as a Royal Marine. But I think this is kind of Royal Marine bravado going on here. They don't want people saying, how can a, a skinny vagrant pass as a Royal Marine? Because we're big, tough guys. But what they're forgetting is a very important thing that this is, although this man is a Royal Marine, he's not, he's not, uh, as Major William Martin, he's not meant to be a soldier. He's desk bound. That's his job. He spends all of his days sitting at his desk, writing papers, analysing things. He's an analyst. That's what he's meant to be. So he wouldn't have, he wouldn't be tough and rough and rugged and, you know, have you know, tattoos and shit like that. He would be a thin man with a kind of a little wispy moustache. And when you look at people like um, some of the other characters involved in this story as well, many of them who are in naval intelligence, you know, really couldn't handle themselves in, in a kind of a physical way so uh as you would expect from obviously a, a a royal marine so um i think all of the evidence does absolutely suggest that it is glindor michael uh on the death certificate which was uh written by sir bentley purchase at uh westminster's uh westminster uh mortuary uh just next to i've, I've posted some pictures online on my website of uh, St Pancras Hospital, which hasn't changed at all, looks exactly as it did. And underneath is the mortuary as well. And right next to that is the coroner's court as well. So it's all ni nicely packed together. The death certificate filled in by Sir Bentley Purchase. Good name there. Um, uh, listed Glyndor Michael as a lunatic. Um, there is belief. It's, it's hard to know where Glyndor had been. But... Because he was neatly shaven uh, and that he had access to a razor and they could tell that there were some f uh, mental disabilities with him, there is a suggestion that he'd actually undergone some treatment um, for either depression or whatever, because he could be committed for depression in the 1940s, into any of the local um, mental asylums. And there is one, the nearest one to there is the Marleybone one. I've checked the records. I can't find any details of it there. But then again, if Glyndor Michael didn't have any details on him, do you know, uh, he, could, he could have signed in as a different name. Or he might not have been signed in at all, so it's really hard to tell. Um, but on the death certificate, it listed his occupation as a labourer of no fixed abode, uh, which was basically right. I think that... The, see, it's... They do say that he didn't have any ID on him, but they mu Glyndor Michael must have had ID on him. He must have had some ID on him because some of the details to do with um, Major William Martin correlate with Glyndor Michael. 
you know, uh, they listed Glyndor Michael as a labourer, and he was a labourer. He was a gardener and a labourer of no fixed abode. That's absolutely true. Um, they said that Major William Martin was born in Cardiff, which is not too far away from Abba Bagoid, which is where Glyndor Martin, Martin came from. So there must have been, although it's not written anywhere, there must have been some... Um, either a missing person's report or maybe he he must have had like a wallet on him or something but uh, obviously that's not listed anywhere um the cause of death death was on glindor's certificate was written down as phosphorus poisoning uh and that he took rat poison in a bid to kill himself whilst of unsound mind um and then when that was done sir bentley purchase went to the registrar filled in the um the death details on on the the burial register and then said to the registrar you don't need to find a plot for him to buried in because he's going to be moved out of england for burial and that was it and all of this is entirely illegal what sir bentley purchase was doing but obviously because he was working incredibly closely with naval intelligence and then mi5 you know he's working for the government he he was part of this big uh, this big plot, so obviously he wouldn't get arrested for it. He's got the, he's got Winston Churchill on his side. Ah, hope you enjoyed my impression. <laughs> uh, now, why was uh, Glyndor Michael the perfect corpse? Why did they? This is a good reason why they didn't uh, use uh, Royal Marines. So, um, on the twenty eighth of January, nineteen forty three, uh, Sir Bentley Purchase contact, contacted Ewan Montague, who was. Uh, uh, the intelligence officer for the Royal Navy, that he had news that he'd found a suitable body, and that was Glyndor Michael, who obviously died from eating rat poison, which contained phosphorus. Uh, now, even though he had uh, phosphorus in his system, um, it was actually perfect, because as I mentioned in there, it dissipated, the phosphide gas dissipated out of the system quick. It caused some damage to the system but not enough that it would be noticed on it would be noticed on a thorough uh, autopsy but not a modest one which is why they had to speed up the autopsy and they would only be able to check for strychnine which was in the rat poison if they tested his hair and that was another thing it's like Sir Bentley Purchase said at the start he said look uh, if he's going to be floating off the coast of Spain he said because Spain uh, Spanish doctors are Roman Catholics they're more than unlikely to do an autopsy unless it's they feel it's absolutely vital if they need to absolutely confirm something whereas if you present them with the facts that basically say this man drowned in water given that it's a hot day and given the fact that the body is probably stinking they'll probably wrap up the, the um, autopsy quick which is what they did uh so so and, and even though uh you and montague quite rightly um, because the body had to look like it had been floating in the water for several days, so the air crash, in advance of this, they'd, they'd sent out a message uh, to British ships saying, keep your eye out for an air, an, uh, a small plane which has crashed just off the coast, uh, the southwest coast of Spain. So they'd already planted that little seed of information out there to the Germans. Uh, so the Nazi high command had already picked that up and gone, OK, there might be an air crash somewhere, a small one on the south coast. So that had already fed into the system. Uh, they they knew that there might be some wreckage floating around, maybe some dead bodies. Um, now, uh, Ewan Montague, the intelligence officer for the Navy, commented that the, the body looked a little bit undernourished, uh, and that he didn't look like a... F uh, but, but that he actually fitted the look of a field officer, which was exactly what he was. He was kind of quite desk-bound. Um, oh, so yeah, so so because he did actually look, because uh, uh, Glindor was actually slightly undernourished anyway, that actually fitted the idea that he'd actually been floated, floating in the sea for a while. Uh, it helped the fact because Glindor had actually started to decay by that point already. Um, his eyes had already actually sunken back into his head. So um, it actually helped with the fact that when they put him in the water, it didn't look like he'd been there for about three or four hours, which he had four hours in total. Uh, it looked like he'd been there for, for about three days. So actually, uh, the death date on the tombstone of, of Glyndor Michael, alias uh, Major William Martin, is actually three days. It's the 28th of April. It's actually three days prior to when he was found. So they actually looked at him and went, OK, he's obviously been here about three days. 
hence it started to decompose um there was a bit of a race against time at the start um when they got the body and they decided that glindor michael was perfect they put him inside uh the freezer at oh, it says St pancras mortuary but on other records that i've read it says uh hackney mortuary so I, i'm unsure which one it is it wasn't exactly confirmed but sir bentley purchase um said that the body needed to be stored at four degrees celsius which is 39 degrees fahrenheit because any colder than that uh, and the flesh would start to freeze and it would be obvious uh to any doctor afterwards that when they defrost him by the look of his skin they'll be able to say okay he's he's been frozen pr previously um so and so bentley purchase warned uh you and montague and charles chumley that as they had the body they had to use him within three months basically uh glindor michael had a best before date <laughs> they didn't stamp it on him but he had a best before date which was three months and they said you have to use his body uh, within three months otherwise he will be decomposed beyond the point of usefulness um on uh any of my social media i probably i might have attached it to uh this episode itself on the on the uh the main logo um i've put one of the one pictures that we have we obviously we didn't have any photos of glindor michael because being a poor man he didn't have any photos taken but they did take a picture of glindor michael in the mortuary on a gurney dressed in the full uh the full royal marines battle dress uh with the with his briefcase and everything and you can see a picture of him he's lying there and he he, he looks he looks dead uh, he really does look dead he looks dead but he suits he, everything suited the fact that he was meant to look like he died in an air crash so uh just and he had been floating in the water for a couple of days um so um obviously they gave him a uniform uh but obviously this was wartime so they had a lot of uniforms they could use they went to jeeves and hawks at number one savile row and had it had a uniform fitted in his exact size which was great everything was uh military issue they were the military they could do what they like uh but there was one piece that was non-issue that was part of the uniform and that was the underwear and the problem is obviously during wartime underwear was in strict short supply and no one was willing to give up their underwear uh, but what they needed this was an important part of the story they can't couldn't just get some crappy old underwear because this is kind of a a middle ranking captain slash acting major he wouldn't be wearing crappy underwear you know they didn't want to ruin the whole facade by having him wear like a crappy pair of briefs so uh what they needed was a good quality pair of woolen underwear um now the warder of new college in oxford one of the big posh colleges uh, a gentleman called uh, herbert fisher had recently just died and not only did he leave behind all of his books and or all of the things he loved uh, but he also left uh, a fantastic collection of a good quality woolen underwear so a pair of these were actually donated to the body of glindor michael uh to complete the facade of uh major william martin which i think was nice i love those little details uh pocket litter obviously uh i mentioned a lot about that there was a lot of really good stuff that they put in there if you go through your pockets right now if you look like to pick up your coat or your handbag or whatever and you go through it if you were to say to yourself what's in my what's in my pockets you probably go yeah i got a wallet keys phone things like that but when you look you'll probably find you'll find lint you'll probably find an old plaster you'll probably find like a bus ticket you know you'll find some receipts um you know we all have pocket litter in our pockets so it was the genius of, of naval intelligence and mi5 that they knew that in order to get it right you've got to get the details right like we've all got lint in our pockets we've all got you know crap that we forget about so it's important to get those details absolutely spot on which is exactly what they did um so one of the things that was mentioned in there that which i thought was sweet that even though glindor michael was single um he's never married as far as we know he never had a girlfriend um they felt it was right to give major william martin uh, a girlfriend now obviously major william martin never existed so they had to fabricate a girlfriend um uh, to inside his wallet to to make it realistic they put in a photograph uh from his invented fiance called pam 
Now, uh, what they did, there was loads of uh, secretaries within Naval Intelligence and MI5, and they they asked all of the ladies if any of them had a photograph of them <coughs> of themselves that they would be happy to donate. And the one that was chosen was uh, uh, I'll, I'll try and put this on the website as well or on social media. This was uh, an MI5 clerk called Leslie Jean. Um, where was it taken? It was just off Oxford. Yeah, it's it's a nice photo of her in kind of a kind of a swimsuit. She looks like she's drying herself with a towel. Towel. It was taken just uh, over in Oxford, just uh, on the banks of the River Thames, and it looks it looks like a very candid, very kind of loving photograph that a, a couple would share with each other, especially a man who's kind of at war and missing his girlfriend. Uh, there was also two love letters in there from Pam. Now. Uh, these weren't written by Leslie Jean at all. They went through a series of kind of different people to try and get the letters right because the tone had to be exactly right. Um, and have I written who it was from? Oh, I bet I haven't. What a dickhead. Um, they went through all the letters. They tried to find uh, people. There, there were different kind of uh, MI5 agents who were working on it and scribes and writers. And in the end, uh, they actually ended up being uh, one of the typists in MI5. Um, single lady, she's a spinster. She, you know, she'd never been married. She hadn't had a boyfriend in a long time. And they read her versions of the letters and it was it was perfect. Do you know, she, do you know, she, she was looking for love and, do you know, she kind of, slightly fell in love with the idea of major william martin um which i thought was nice so it gave a real authenticity to the letters and it didn't mean that um the nazis would read any of this but the idea was that if they came across any of these details they were open up it was an extra layer to this kind of fabrication of story you couldn't just put a man in a uniform you had to get all of the details exactly right so if they would pull out a, like a ticket stub to a theatre show the ticket stub to the West End Theatre show was dated, I think it was between the 18th of April and 24th of April. So that's the kind of period of time that they said Major William Martin was in London. He was in the West End. So they fabricated his life for those, basically those six days to make it exact. Because obviously that's as long as you'd probably carry uh, your pocket litter with you. Uh, after that, you'd probably clear it out of your pockets. Um also in there, as mentioned, was a receipt for a diamond engage engagement ring suggesting that he was going to marry Pam, uh, which I thought was a nice touch. Uh, <laughs> he also had uh, correspondence from his father, which I mentioned that he, he's, uh, um, <laughs> he was, didn't seem to like his father. And I think they enjoyed writing that a little bit too much. Uh, what else is in there as well? Just some fabulous stuff, as mentioned. You know, stamps, cigarettes, matches, obviously all important to have. A stubby pencil, some keys, uh, receipts. A bill for four nights at lodgings at the Navy and Military Club was added. So those for, were the dates uh, from the 18th to the 24th around that period, which is great. Um, and... They they went to S J Phillips the jewellers on Bond Street, uh, and although a ring wasn't bought, they never physically bought a ring. It was it was like thirteen thousand pounds worth of ring, which fifty three pounds in those days it was a lot of money, and they obviously couldn't afford that. So they spoke to, but sorry, got burps. They got spoke to S J Phillips the jewellers and asked for a receipt. Asked them to put one out, and it made it authentic. It made it real. But obviously later on, S J Phillips went through there. Uh, archives and they were like yep there was definitely no ring sold of that value around that date um one interesting thing that i didn't put in the uh oh that's nice that i didn't put into the uh story but i will attach probably to the video uh there's a nice documentary like a 45 minute documentary by um by the gentleman oh a big chunk of it i based on his book i'll i'll, I'll flag it up shortly but a really good book about oh um uh, ben mcintyre's book about operation mincemeat um there's a nice documentary that i'll put in there and you can just watch it. it's 45 minutes it's very nicely told really enjoyable um but one thing that i didn't put into the story is the fact that they in order to get the id correct and for it to match glindor michael they needed a photo but obviously glindor michael obviously the his family wasn't notified that he was dead 
and he was a homeless man and he was poor therefore he didn't have any photos so they were like okay well let's take a photograph of him and they tried to take a photo of the corpse but obviously a corpse looks dead <laughs> and by the time they got to him glindor michael already his eyes had sunken back into his head do you know and he'd been defrosted and he'd been frozen and he'd been defrosted and he'd been refrosted so it wasn't any good so uh, they needed to find someone who looked like a uh, glindor michael and would pass as uh, Major William Martin. And they tried loads of different people, and it was really difficult to absolutely find anyone. And then, then of all things that would happen, uh, Sir Charles Chumley, who obviously was um, the intelligence officer, officer for MI5, in his own building was a gentleman called Captain Ronnie Reed. Uh, and he was just like, this is remarkable. The two men look so identical. Obviously, they didn't know exactly what uh, Glyndor Michael looked like because he started to decompose. But they knew that he was of a certain height. He'd got dark hair. It was kind of swept to the side. He'd got a little moustache. He'd got a kind of a little thin face. And they were like, this is perfect. So they took a photo of Captain Ronnie Reed and used that as Glyndor Michael, alias Major William Martin. Um and and it really helped. He had three cards on him and passes, and uh, these needed to look like he was a long-serving officer. Um, and in order to get the photos right as well, because you couldn't... This is what I love about the story, is the attention to detail. They didn't just make him um, IDs. They had to make it look like it had been used, like it had been there for quite a while, that he was a long-serving officer. So you and Montague, actually, for the next couple of weeks, when they got the photo... Oh, ow, my leg's gone numb. When they got the photo of Ronnie Reed... Um, he actually spent weeks just rubbing it on his leg to take the sheen off the photo to make it look old. And then, like, um, he would use the... Uh, same as Charles Chumley would wear the uniform to give it the wear and tear, you know, uh, the walking wear and tear, you know, underneath your arms, between your legs, things like that. It would have a bit of a, uh, a, a wear and tear. He did the same with the ID. He'd keep it in his pocket so it had a bit of a bend to it, which is really important. If you if you look at anything that you carry on you, like uh, ID, things like that, anything you keep in your pocket, it always has a bit of a bend to it, which is really important. Uh, one thing I left out the story just because it slowed it down, just because I wanted the first half of the story to be quite slow and the second half to be dum -dum 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 -dum, quite exciting. Um, in the early hours of the 17th of April 1943, as they were preparing the body of Glyndor Michael, obviously dressed as Major William Martin, of which there's a photo, um, there was one last minute hitch and that was th as they were defrosting him um, he I mean he wasn't frosted he, but he was cold but they were trying to re get his body up to a, a kind of a, a, a regular temperature so they could actually put his clothes on him uh, the problem was his, his feet were frozen and this, this was actually a problem that Glyndor Michael suffered from anyway because of neurosyphilis he had really bad problems with circulation in his feet anyway uh, but the, but the corpse definitely had problems, and the feet were frozen. They couldn't get the boots on, so they so they had to get an electric fire, not too close, but they had to put an electric fire by his feet to warm up the toes of the corpse of Glyndor Michael, just so they could put the boots on properly. Otherwise, they'd have to cut the boots and then restitch them, and then everyone would go, "Hang on, why do we have a military officer with cu cut open boots?" Um. Another thing that was in there, so uh, the canister, the metal canister. Now, uh, obviously, they drove it up to Greenock, put it on HMS Seraf, the submarine, which was great. Uh, anyone, uh, obviously, Lieutenant Norman Jewell, who was the captain, and only the most senior officers knew exactly what the mission was, which is why only they came to the surface and unloaded the body. All the rest of the crew were sent to the other part of the boat, and, you know, were locked away and they couldn't see what was going on. But as the canister was loaded onto the submarine, uh, everyone was told that this was basically just meteorological equipment. Uh, secret meteorological equipment they were going to launch off the coast of Spain. They thought that was what the mission was. But really, Norman Jewell, the captain and his senior staff, they knew exactly what was doing because they had to load the body into the water. Um, so it's uh so the submarine traveled uh it, they were roughly around 12 12 miles out uh from the coast uh so they couldn't be seen 
uh, and they emptied the container, they pushed it into the water. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so, um, backtrack. So, they'd already got rid of the body. The body was, uh, had already been floated to coast. So, the submarine obviously still had the metal container and they wanted to get rid of that. So, they... They drove the submarine about 12 miles out of the coast. Uh, they put it into the water, pushed it into the water, and it floated. And they riddled it with machine gun fire so that it would sink. Uh, unfortunately, there was air trapped in it, and it really didn't sink at all. And they, they entirely wanted to get rid of it. Um, so what they had to do was uh, pack it with plastic explosives and then blow it up, which is lovely. <laughs> Um, and immediately after this had been done, <coughs> uh, Lieutenant Norma Jewell sent a message to the Admiralty, Naval Admiralty, saying mincemeat completed, and they continued their journey to Gibraltar. Um, I mentioned very briefly in this as well that uh, why did they pick where Huelva uh, off the southwest coast of Spain? Doesn't seem like an important place at all when you think about it, but <coughs> it was really just a small coastal town with uh, the port of Huelva. But, as briefly mentioned, it was important to them. What they needed was for this information to fall into the right hand. This is so many different pieces of story that have to work for this story to... For this plot to work. But it, literally, they needed that... Those few lines in the sentence, in a letter, in the briefcase, attached to the dead corpse floating in the water to arrive to be arrive on shore to be found by a fisherman which it which it was to be brought onto the shore for the fisherman to alert the spanish authorities and by alerting the spanish authorities which was his job his responsibility he had to if he found a body therefore they knew that the germans would be notified and in that town lived adolf klaus who was a german spy who they knew about he was he was known as the shadow Ooh, he was a very he was a good spy, but as mentioned, he was unimaginative, and this is why they knew that the, they could make the plot work because British are very deceptive, and kind of like uh, Im imaginative stories like this. Whereas they know that the Germans tend to think in very linear lines, are very unimaginative. I apologise to any German out there, but this is the way it was thought of in the nineteen forties. Is that Britain loves all these kind of spy stories and things, and German Germans think in very linear lines, Do you know? And that's the way that the that's the way that Nazi intelligence did, and the German spies, and Adolf Klaus, who was there, was exactly the same. They knew that if Spanish authorities were alerted, he would find out. He would get get himself involved. He would try and get the the suitcase to him. And he would be because because he was a careerist as well. He was desperate to rise through the ranks. So he knew that he would get a piece of information, and he would make sure it got straight to uh, Nazi HQ. Obviously, the, there was a bit of a delay in there here. I didn't put this into the story, but um, what actually happened was the 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 suitcase ended up into Spanish naval headquarters in Cadiz, and then it got put into a safe. And basically, the Spanish authorities sat on it for a couple of days. They were like, "No, it's not going anywhere." And the the Nazis, uh, the Adolf Klaus, the Nazis, the Germans were all going, "Oh, we but we want this, we want this." And the British were going, "Fuck's sake, we want them to have it!" But obviously, they couldn't shout about that. They were like, "And obviously, you've got um, the British diplomat that was there, Francis." Oh, I don't think I put that in the story, did I? I might have taken that out. There was. Um, British diplomat who was there, who was overseeing the autopsy, but he was there entirely on the case. He was one of the people who was really speeding up the the autopsy, saying, "Oh, come on, it's a hot day. Come on, we're dying here. Let's 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 just let's just say that he uh, he suffocated." He was in on the story as well, and he was trying to push, trying to do his job and say, "Look, that is." A British briefcase. We need to have it back. It's ours. You shouldn't be looking at it. But at the same time, he didn't want to push his luck by saying, "Don't look in the suitcase," or you know, uh, leading them to say, "Oh, have it for a few more days and photograph the evidence." Uh, so it almost cocked up at the end. It was a story. Have a look at the documentary. It's fantastic. But it almost cocked up at the end just through people being too officious. Uh, but yeah, it ended up in the hands of Adolf Klaus. Adolf Klaus sent it to his higher ups, who sent it to Hitler. Hitler, interestingly, said no. 
He said, no, I I don't think the invasion is going to be in Greece and Sardinia. He said, um, Winston Churchill was absolutely right. Winston Churchill said, uh, only an idiot would not know that it was it was um, Sicily. The invasion was in Sicily. And uh, Adolf Hitler entirely agreed. He was like, no, 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 it is definitely going to be Sicily. But what British intelligence were doing, they'd already fed pieces of information to uh, various different Nazi sources throughout time, not definitely saying, hey, it is in Sicily. It's going to be in Sicily. Oh, it's going to be in uh, Greece and Corsica, the invasion. But what they'd done is that they'd, they'd said, you know, there's new troop movements at this part and new troop troop movements here and it kind of it, it all of these tiny pieces of information came together within that sentence within that letter so that's why this letter was important it kind of crystallized the fact that there was going to be invasion on uh, a specific coast uh, very shortly so that's why this letter was important and it had to arrive in in the right hands um a nice kind of side note uh, to the end of this story. Um, there are some memorials to Glyndor Michael, which is which is really nice. So, um, so in 1998, the uh, true identity of Major William Martin, alias Glyndor Michael, was released by the British government. Uh, so, onto the gravestone at uh, Nestra Sonora Cemetery, uh, you've got a gravestone, and it says. Uh, Major William Martin, and it's got uh, the day of his birth because they uh, they knew when he when Major Martin was born because obviously he got his military ID. They knew he was from Cardiff. They knew the name of his father because it was on the letter, uh, and they knew roughly when he was died. So it's date date of death is on there as well, and he, uh, his rank was on there, and all the details about his life on his gravestone. But in 1998, what they did was they they inscribed. A new part underneath it that says Glyndor Michael, who served as Major William Martin, Royal Navy, which is nice. So so even though Glyndor Michael was lost and forgotten and, you know, he doesn't have a grave in his in his own country. Uh, he does overseas and uh, he got full military honours for that. Um, there's also another uh, a plaque in in his hometown of Aberbagoid in South Wales. Uh, it's a plaque on a war memorial in the Memorial Garden. Uh, and I, <laughs> I won't try and read uh, it in Welsh because it is inscribed in Welsh. Uh, but what it actually says is Glyndor Michael. It's got his date of birth, 1909 to 1943. A Welsh transcription. And that translates as the man, <coughs> the man who never was. Which is is the name of the book that it uh, it eventually became. There's, there is a film out there, uh, 1956, I believe. Uh, can't remember who was in it, but it's a film. Uh, the Man Who Never Was, very good, good book uh, about the uh, s- the story of Major William Martin and Operation Minspeed. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. That's a different story. Obviously, next week I'll be doing. Um, back to regular regular murder cases uh but this week i thought i'd give you something different an interesting story an underdog story uh just as a side note we got we got some sad news this week unfortunately uh so you probably won't know her name but uh her name was lottie um she was my my sister-in-law's um my sister-in-law's dog. She's about she's about eight years old uh she's gordon setter absolutely lovely really sweet uh used to every time i'd go and see her she'd come and sit on my lap uh and get all heavy and go like that she's really lovely but um she played a couple of roles in some of the murder mile episodes so uh in episode four she played the role of dutch layer's puppy uh and in the dennis nielsen episodes 11 and 12 she played dennis nielsen's um uh, mongrel dog bleep and even though she wasn't a trained act- actress she did a really good job uh, so unfortunately, unfortunately, Lottie passed away at the weekend. So, uh, so R I P Lot Lottie, who I used to call Lionel because she had, she had hair like Lionel Richie. Um, so, uh, I think that's it. That's it. That's the end of Extra Mile for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Interesting story. 
God knows how I'm going to edit it. It's going to be a bugger. Uh, I'm actually disappearing for the weekend. I'm going to see friends. I know. A bit of a social life. What's going on? Very exciting. So I'm doing. So I'm editing this. I'm going to disappear off now. Uh, there's no noise outside. There's no coots, really. I'm in a nice, quiet place, which is really nice. It's very peaceful. Uh, so now I'm going to bugger off. Um, I don't think we got any new, new sign-offs this week. Uh, I think we're okay. So I'm just going to end it uh, by saying... Um, wish you all a have a uh, have a what? Oh, we are <laughs> forgotten how to speak. Bollocks. Have yourselves a lovely week. Stay safe. Don't end up dead. Uh, and I will, uh, etc., etc. You all soon. Lots of love. Bye.